Hello and welcome to Hawk Mountain Sanctuary's Home Discovery Series. Today's program is Clean Water, Let's Dive In with Katie Register, Executive Director of Clean Virginia Waterways. Hey there, hi everybody. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us today, Katie. My name is Jamie Dawson and I'm the Director of Education at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. We are so glad that you are joining us today. As you may know, Hawk Mountain is the world's very first refuge for birds of prey. And we continue to work hard to be leaders in raptor conservation, science, and education locally and globally around the world. Hawk Mountain is a private nonprofit and membership is the lifeblood of our organization. To all of our members, thank you so very much for your continued support. And if you're joining us today and you're not a member, we hope that you consider becoming one in the future. Hawk Mountain hopes that everyone remains safe and healthy during these times of COVID challenges, and we are thrilled to offer our local and global community a variety of free virtual programming. As always, Hawk Mountain greatly appreciates and depends on donations. Just so everyone is aware, today's program is being recorded. The video will then be accessible on Hawk Mountain's YouTube channel as a continued resource. We also have a link on our website directly connecting you to our YouTube channel. At any point during today's program, viewers may submit questions through the Q&A feature on the Zoom platform. We've designated time at the end of the program to take some questions from the audience. And don't be shy, because this is your chance to ask questions to a water expert. So we are so excited that Katie Register is joining us today to teach us about why water is so important and what we all can do to help keep our water clean. And before we go further, I'd like to take a moment to share some of Katie's background experience with our audience. Katie Register works extensively on preventing water pollution, focusing mainly on land-based sources of plastic pollution. She has done extensive research on ways to prevent littering, the impacts of cigarette litter, and she helped design a campaign that is focused on stopping the intentional releases of helium-filled balloons. Katie is Executive Director of Clean Virginia Waterways, which is dedicated to improving our rivers and oceans through citizen stewardship. She has consulted with the National Geographic Society, the US Environmental Protection Agency, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, Ocean Conservancy, the Virginia Coastal Zone Management Plan, as well as corporations. Katie has a master's degree from Miami University in biology and a master's degree from George Mason University in environmental science and public policy. Her thesis examined the environmental impacts of the number one most common type of litter, which is cigarette butts. And I'd also like to share that I had the privilege of being in the same graduate program as Katie with Miami University's Global Field Program. And I first met her back in 2012 on a graduate field course in Belize, where we studied community-based conservation, marine ecology, and lots of other awesome things. And I can't resist sharing a picture of Katie and I in Belize. So here we are back in 2012, and we're actually on a key uh, in Belize, and we were, were doing a lot of really cool field work uh, for marine ecology. So I just had to share that, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind. That was a great day. It was. So Katie, you're clearly so passionate about water conservation. How did you become so interested in this field? Well, um, I once went to a river cleanup. It was a little tiny stream in Arlington, Virginia. And I was amazed at how much plastic and trash was in that little tiny stream. So that really got me focused on, on wanting to keep that kind of pollution out of our waterways. But ever since I was a little kid, I loved frogs and turtles and being outside. And uh, so it kind of was a natural thing that I would gravitate towards loving water. Wonderful. And I know that you live in Virginia now, but have you ever made it up to Kempton, Pennsylvania to visit Hawk Mountain Sanctuary? Uh, yeah, actually, many years ago, my husband and I camped up there one weekend in October, and we spent almost the entire Saturday and Sunday watching the migration. It was, it was life-changing. It was beautiful. I need to come back. <laughs> Yes, please come back and visit. We hope to see you soon. Um, so we are excited for your presentation and to learn more about the very important work you do with Clean Virginia Waterways. 
So Katie, teach us about water. What can we do to help? Okay, great, great. Well, I will share my screen. I've got some uh, slides to show you. There we go. Yeah, so uh, thank you, first of all, for inviting me. It's my favorite topic. Love to talk about water. And here I am all of a sudden unable to advance. There we go. So water is, of course, so important to life on Earth. There's no substitute for it. It's vital to what we eat. A great deal of water is used in growing our food. It's used in manufacturing as well as fun, recreation. We love to go to the beach to fish or lay on the sand or walk. Um, and transportation, an awful lot of what's in our home and what we wear and what we eat comes to us via transportation over the ocean. It's absolutely critical to life on Earth. I wanted to start also by just uh, making sure we all have the same definition of watershed. Often that term is misused, uh, but basically a watershed is an area of land. It's an area of land uh, through which the water flows, either flows across the top of the land, it's called runoff, or under uh, groundwater, all goes to the lowest point, which is a stream, a river, a lake. So again, a watershed is an area of land and they can be very small, like perhaps there's a park that you know of, that little park has a watershed. Uh, also the Mississippi River drains a great deal of the United States. So watersheds can be small and they can be large. And here's a little animation. If rain falls on one side of a hill, it will go towards the nearest stream. But if the raindrop falls just a few feet away on the other side of the hill, it might end up in an entirely different watershed. So here's a picture of our beautiful, beautiful planet taken by Apollo astronauts in the 1970s. And you can see that most of the planet is covered with water. And I want to ask you, what percentage of the earth is covered with water? Pick a number, one to 100. Well, the answer is about 71%. About 71% of our planet earth is covered with water. In fact, there's a, a famous author who once said that he thought that we should not so much call our planet earth as we should call it planet ocean because we've got more ocean than we do have earth. So that's an interesting thought changing our name. Also, most of the water on Earth is salty. It's found in oceans. As we just saw from that picture, a lot of oceans cover our, uh, our Earth. So what percentage of all water on Earth is salt water and how much of it is fresh water? Well, the answer is about 97% of all water on Earth is salt water. The 3% that is fresh, meaning not salty, that includes the water in our lakes, like the Great Lakes, rivers, glaciers, and groundwater. In fact, of that 3%, most of it is in glaciers. So the amount of fresh water that we have available to us is rather limited, and that's why we want to take good care of it and keep it clean. Now, water on planet Earth is found in all three states. It's found naturally occurring as ice, frozen, a solid. It's naturally occurring, obviously, as liquid, and it's naturally occurring as vapor. And this is very unusual for a substance to be naturally found in all three states. And all water is connected. So our, that little stream that you know of, perhaps by your home or in your community, flows to a larger stream, flows to a river, perhaps it flows to a bay, and ultimately all of our water is connected to each other. And there's a lovely story I heard about a little boy who was playing in a stream with his friends and he leaned over the water and he started singing a song. And his friend said, what are you doing? And the boy said, well, all, all water is connected so I'm singing a song to a whale in the ocean. I just love that story. That little boy understood all of our water truly is connected. 
Another really fascinating thing about water is that ice floats. When water freezes, ice floats. And you might say, of course it does. You know, when you get a soda or water with ice in it, ice is at the top. But this is actually very unusual. Substances, for the most part, when they're solid, they sink to the bottom. Uh, like if you've ever seen lead being melted, or if you ever see dry ice, the frozen versions of those are at the bottom, um, and then the liquid is on top. But we're lucky here on Earth, ice floats. And so happy little fish can live down in streams and rivers uh, rather than have the ice freeze from the bottom up. So it's a very unique feature of, of water. I also wanted to spend a minute talking about groundwater. Groundwater is basically the water that seeps through, uh, like when it rains, some of the water will go over the land surface and come to a stream or river, but a lot of that water will soak down and join the water table. The water table is the top of the saturated zone. And by saturated, we mean it's full of water. In between the fractured rocks, in between the gravel is water. And a lot of Americans depend on groundwater for their drinking water. Uh, I do, I live in the country and my husband and I have a well. And so we pull up water from the groundwater to drink. So it's a very important source of water. And what's really cool, another cool thing about water, is take a look on the right side of that illustration. You see surface water, right? You see the, uh, it could be a pond or a stream. We don't know from this illustration. But a lot of times you'll see a stream uh, that still has water in it, even though it hasn't rained, maybe for weeks and weeks, but that stream still has water. How is that possible? It hasn't rained. Well, it's possible because groundwater is a major source of water for our streams and rivers. And you can see how high the water table is by looking at how high the surface of that stream is uh, during a period when it's not gotten a lot of rain. And here's just another picture of that same idea that the water table, the top of the water table where it intersects with a depression in the, in the landscape, you will have surface water. Now here's a lovely picture of a lovely healthy stream. Take a look at it and see why do you think this is a healthy stream? And you see lots of vegetation on both banks. Um, and vegetation is very important because it provides shade to the water. The animals that live in this water prefer cool water. Cool water will hold more uh, dissolved oxygen, which they breathe, like the larva of dragonflies. If you love dragonflies, you want to have a healthy stream like this because dragonflies live uh, when they're young in streams and they, just, they prefer cool streams. Also, all those leaves and twigs become food for some of the animals that live in that stream. So this is a healthy stream, and you don't see any pollution. You don't see any paper bags or plastic bags or any other trash. Now, this stream's not so healthy. You see that there, it doesn't have trees around it. It's not shaded. Uh, if you were a little animal living in this stream, you probably would not be as happy as you would have been in that other stream. You also see a lot of erosion going on. On the left side of this stream, the grass is, you know, grass roots are not very deep. If you pull up grass and look, they're, they're only an inch or two of roots. So when it rains, this stream gets a lot of erosion because the grass just can't hold on. Now, if this stream had lots of bushes and lots of trees, especially native to the area, uh, this stream could recover and become healthier. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that we put into water which cause pollution, uh, certainly runoff from the land. So it rains, and that rain rushes to the nearby stream, and it picks up whatever is loose on the surface. It could be uh, from an urban area. It could be uh, perhaps antifreeze or oil that comes from cars. It could be litter and trash. It could be 
uh, doggy do if people are walking their dogs and not picking up uh, the waste. So urban runoff can contribute pollution. Construction sites can also provide pollution if they're not managed correctly. Construction sites should take efforts to make sure there's no erosion. So when it rains, you don't get a bunch of soil going into the stream. And then agricultural fields can be a source of different kinds of polluted runoff. Animal waste, for example, and erosion against soil that gets picked up by the water as it's rushing towards a stream. Another source of pollution comes actually from the air. This is called atmospheric deposition. And some of the pollutants from the air are air pollutants that then get picked up by rain and get deposited, or they deposit as dust. Maybe you've heard the last couple of weeks, there's a lot of new awareness about tiny bits of plastic that are in the air, nano pieces of plastic that are coming out of the air and being deposited into water bodies and on the land. And then another type of pollution is litter, and I'll, I've got a slide or two about that later. So water pollution can be a chemical, like oil or fertilizer. It can be physical, uh, like soil when it gets into the water, or plastic when it gets into the water. Or it can be biological. By this, we mean perhaps an invasive fish or an invasive plant, a plant or fish or virus or something like that that is not native to that body of water. So water pollution can be chemical, physical, or biological, a change in water quality that has a harmful effect, either on the organisms that live in it or the water suitability for our desires. Like if we wanna swim in a lake, uh, we wanna make sure that it doesn't have some of these pollutants that could make us sick. Uh, here again is just a list of some chemical pollutants that, that can include oil and gasoline, pesticides. You know, these are pesticides are chemicals we put down to kill certain pests. Some pesticides are made for insects and they're called insecticides. And some pesticides are to kill plants that are undesirable, but none of these should be in the water. We want to make sure that we don't have polluted runoff bringing pesticides to the water. And then cleaning solvents, detergents, there's all kinds of things that can be pollutants. Uh, fertilizer. Now this one, sometimes people say, well, isn't fertilizer good? Fertilizer causes plants to grow. And we think of fertilizer as a good thing. Well, it's not a good thing in the water. And the same with animal waste whether it's from dogs in town or cows uh, in the country. Um, and then there's failing septic systems. Again, people who live in the country don't have the sewage from their home, you know, everything from the shower and the toilets going to a place to be cleaned by the city because they live in the country. So they've got septic systems. And it, if they're not taken care of, all of these can be a source of water pollution. And here's a little picture of what happens, fertilizers, animal waste, and the liquid and failed septic systems all have nutrients and nutrients are nitrogen and phosphorus. And what happens when these get in the water, as you see, the algae love it. The algae love this because it's basically fertilizer. So they bloom and you get an algae bloom. Sometimes these are called red tides uh, they've got different names depending on the color of the algae, but ultimately algae blooms can block the sunlight, which isn't good for all the little plants that want to live at the bottom of that body of water. But ultimately algae doesn't live very long. It dies after a few days and as they die, they decay. And the process of decaying will take oxygen out of the water. And so if you're a fish or a clam, or a crab or anything else trying to live in that water, you depend on oxygen in the water. And so algae blooms are very bad because you will not have enough oxygen. Um, and this happens every year in the Gulf of Mexico because of 
fertilizers and animal waste that come down the Mississippi. It happens around the world in many bodies of water, including the Chesapeake Bay. Here's just a, a picture of what uh, I was talking about earlier about erosion of soil. Uh, this first top pot picture shows somebody put up a fence of fabric. It's called a silt fence. And their goal was to keep the soil on the land, but they got a big storm. And you can see that this fence is failing. Uh, it's failing to hold up back all that mud. And where is that mud going to go? It's going to go down the storm drain. It's going to go into the nearby stream. And you see the bottom picture, a small creek at the confluence with a larger body of water. The confluence is when two bodies of water come together. And you can see that somebody in that little watershed of that little creek is doing something to create a lot of erosion. There's a lot of sediment in the water. You can see from the color. Uh, again, if you're a lovely little dragonfly larva living in a stream, you need to breathe the oxygen, dissolved oxygen. But if all of a sudden your air, I'm sorry, your water is full of mud and, and sand and sediment, uh, you can't breathe. So it, uh, sediment in the water is a very big problem that we can prevent by making sure if we disturb soil, we put up enough silt fences, we put in bales of hay, we do what we need to do to keep that out of the water. So as Jamie uh, said in her introduction, I focus on litter and solid waste, basically our trash that ends up in the waterways. And the biggest problem with litter in the water is that animals either eat it, they think it looks like food, or they get entangled, they get caught up in our trash. And so this is why for the last 25 years, I have focused my work on decreasing the amount of litter that ends up in the ocean or even in our rivers and streams. So uh, that picture on the left, you see a bottle and, a, and a gloves and a cup with these little diamond shapes. You see those diamond shaped cutouts? Those are all bite marks of sea turtles. Sea turtles that mistook these floating pieces of debris for food. And then we've got a sea turtle there that accidentally got a ring caught around its neck. And I'm gonna show you a few pictures of animals that have been impacted by marine debris. The good news is all of these animals were saved, uh, but other animals are not so lucky. And that's why we all have to work together constantly to keep trash out of the waterways. Here's a manatee in Florida that got a rope caught around its um, fin there. And here's uh, a seal that got in a fishing net. And again, these are lucky animals because somebody was able to help them. And here's a um, a, a bird that got caught uh, up with a six pack ring, which actually we do not find very many anymore uh, of six pack rings. I think people really got the message. If you have a six pack ring, cut it up and dispose of it properly because in the environment, they can be very dangerous. Something else that uh, we have worked on is balloons. Now you might think this picture looks uh, like happy and festive, but in fact, 100% of those balloons, 100% are going to come back down into the environment. And because our planet is 71% covered with water, a lot of those are going to land in the water. In fact, my organization worked with the Virginia Aquarium, and we did a four-year study, and we found out that on these islands in Virginia where nobody lives, balloon debris, and that means the balloons as well as ribbons, are the second most commonly found type of debris on these islands where no one lives. So balloons really do travel. So please never, never, never release a balloon into the air. If you have a balloon, enjoy it, but then pop it and drop it into the trash. And humans are also impacted. It's not just animals, but um, a fishing line, for example, can get caught up on a 
uh, propeller of a boat and it can cause the engine to burn out and there you are floating along needing to get some help. And there's other things on the beach that we just don't want on the beach that are sharp. So humans are impacted by this as well. And then other forms of pollution that I already mentioned in base of plants and animals, uh, that's plants and animals that don't belong in a certain body of water. But there's two other kinds of pollution. One is noise. Uh, you might know that dolphins and whales and many other species in the ocean communicate through sound. And so our oceans have become more and more noisy uh, with boats and jet skis and all the things that we're doing. So noise is actually a type of pollution that animals are, are having to deal with. And then heat, uh, with climate change, uh, heat. A lot of people say that climate change is really about the heating up of the oceans. The oceans are definitely getting warmer, which has all kinds of impacts on sea life as well as humans. So how can you help? Oh my gosh, there's so many ways we can all help reduce water pollution. And the first thing we can do is keep pollution out. Uh, more is not better. I love this phrase, more is not better when it comes to fertilizer. More is not better when it comes to the use of pesticides. Uh, also, know what time of year you should fertilize, if you wanna fertilize your lawn. Uh, September and October, for many of us in the United States, is the best time. Uh, so learn about you know, where you live and what's the best time of year to do things. Because other than that, if you're putting down fertilizer in the wrong time of year, you're wasting money, plus a lot of it could end up in our waterways. Be sure to clean up the pet waste. If you're out walking Fido, make sure you pick up what other Fido leaves, uh, because the waste from dogs and other animals have nutrients. Again, we don't want that in the water. Plus, they also have bad stuff like pathogens. And it's really important to remember, if you live in a city or a town that has storm drains, storm drains are connected almost entirely directly to streams. In a few towns, storm water drains may be connected to a place where they'll get treated but for the most of us, storm drains go to streams. So nothing should go down the storm drain except rain. And then I put this little reminder, just one quart of oil, one quart of oil can contaminate up to 2 million gallons of drinking water. So nothing down the storm drain except rain. Another thing you can do is consider adding a rain barrel uh, if you have a house that uh, you're able to do this with, rain barrels can hold on to rain until you need it for the garden in a few days. They're not meant to be long-term storage. They're meant to be, oh, it's raining today. Let's gather some of that rain and then release it to our garden uh, a few days later. You can either do little rain barrels. These rain barrels hold about 45 gallons each, the red ones, uh, and then there's an apartment building that has a larger cistern. So the rain is gathered by the roof, goes down those pipes into the cistern, uh, that big black thing, and then the cistern is able to be used uh, for the gardens. And in some communities, cistern water is used to flush toilets and things like that. But all of this will help reduce the amount of runoff coming off your property or coming off a property during a rainstorm. You also, this is very important. Unfortunately, there are people who litter. Uh, some litter is purposeful. People who like throw it out their car window. Some of it's accidental, like it blows out the back of a truck. But uh, unfortunately, we have to remove litter and you can do it on your own. Here's a young man who at Santa Marina uh, with a fishing net getting a plastic bottle out of the water, or you can do it as part of a group. In fact, this fall, There'll be cleanups all over the world as part of the international coastal cleanup. And that's what I organize in Virginia. But any state you live in, you can go out there either on your own or as a group and pick up litter. And one of the great things that you can also do to help scientists like myself is collect data. There's a smart app that you can get if you have a smartphone. It's called CleanSwell. 
Now, Clean Swell is an app that's made by the Ocean Conservancy, and you download it on your phone and oh, I found six cigarette butts, and you enter it on the app, and I found seven bottle caps, enter it on the app. When you're done, you hit the button that says I'm done, and your data will be added to an international database on what is out there. What are we finding? What kind of debris? The data then are used on solutions. Uh, earlier, Jamie mentioned that I've done some work to reduce intentional releases of balloons. You know, people who buy 200 balloons full of helium on plastic ribbons, take them outside and let them go. And we're trying to help them understand that 100% of that does become litter. But the reason we started that research was because of data collected by volunteers. And we started to see, wow, not only are there a lot of balloon litters items out there, but they disproportionately accumulate on the coasts. There's more balloon litter right at the coast of the ocean on beaches than there is inland because balloons travel. So volunteer collected data is very important to help us understand solutions. And here's an example of some of that data. Uh, we took 20 years of data from 1995 through 2014. We aggregated it so that we could see what are the biggest problems. Now this data is for the state of Virginia. However, it's uh, not very different from what you would find worldwide and, and in the United States. Uh, as you see, the number one type of litter in Virginia is cigarette butts, cigarette filters. And those are plastic, by the way, those little white fibers that you see in a cigarette butt, uh, those are actually a type of plastic, cellulose acetate, not cotton. And then you see all of the things that are in yellow are things that we, basically litter that comes from what we eat and drink beverage bottles, bags, cups, food wrappers, caps and lids. So look, if we stopped people from littering what they, uh, from what they eat and drink, the bottles and food wrappers and such, we would eliminate almost the entire top 10 items of debris. I mean, that would be so amazing. Um, and also I should point out that most of the items on this list are made of plastic. Not all of them, but most of them are made of plastic. So that's why a lot of people are calling this a plastic pollution problem. Um, and plastic pollution is a problem not just in the ocean, but on land as well. So there's a lot of work we can do to make this list disappear. Uh, there is a lot more plastic coming though, however, this chart shows us that the predictions are there's gonna be a lot more plastic in our future. Um, and most of this plastic is used once. Uh, you know, it's a bottle or it's a cap or it's a, a sandwich bag. So there's a lot of decisions we all can make to see how we personally can contribute to decreasing how much plastic we're using just once. I mean, something that you use for years and years uh, is different. Uh, like. I, one of my favorite water bottles is made out of plastic, but I've had it, well, I've had it since Belize. So I've had it since <laughs> 2012. Um, so it's the single use plastics we wanna take a hard look at and see how we can decrease those use. And that bottom line, we cannot recycle our way out of this problem. That's a real true statement. Recycling is important, absolutely. But uh, if you remember the three R's, Reduce is the first one. Reduce means reduce the amount of uh, single-use plastics. And then reuse what you do have. And the last thing is to recycle. So remember to reduce and reuse, uh, very important. So that means drinking tap water. We're very lucky that in most of the United States, our tap water costs next to nothing. It's incredibly economic. Uh, and good for our, our wallet, and it's healthy and good for us. So do consider drinking more tap water uh, as well as using 
uh, reusable uh, coffee cups and water bottles and shopping bags, all that reusable stuff's great. So uh, that's uh, basically the, the big story I wanted to share with you. And you know, I wanted to say thank you so much for caring about our, our water here on our earth. It's uh, a finite, we're, you know, it's not, we're not creating new water. We've got to take care of the water that we have. And uh, it's a job that we all can do, whether we're four years old or 104 years old, we can all make decisions that help us take care of our earth's water. And with that, I say thank you. There's my email address and our website. We're also on Facebook. I would love it if you would like Clean Virginia Waterways on Facebook. On that uh, Facebook page, you'll learn about some of our, uh, the work we're doing. Like we have a new website called preventbloomlitter.org, preventbloomlitter.org. And uh, it's got lots of great ideas on how to celebrate without creating litter, without releasing balloons. But if you join us on Facebook, uh, you'll see links to that and many other resources throughout the year. So at this point, uh, I guess, Jamie, I'll turn it back over to you and we'll see if we've got any questions. It sounds good. Katie, thank you so much. That was quite an inspiring presentation and really puts things into perspective at how important it is um, to keep our waterways clean. So thank you so much for sharing your expertise. Sure. So we do have a few questions. Okay, so the first question, Katie, um, is it true that water vapor can freeze without becoming liquid first and also the reverse? Okay, so can water vapor, which is a gas, become frozen without becoming water first? Well, that's a great question. Um, because a lot of times we think that that process, it goes from solid to water to gas, and then gas back to liquid, back to solid. But in fact, it is possible for water vapor, which is a gas, to become frozen. And the best example I can give you is when you go out on a cold winter's day to your car that's been out all night, and it hasn't rained, it hasn't snowed, and yet there's frost, there's frost on your car. So that is an example of how water vapor, when it gets cold enough, can go right to frozen without turning liquid first. And um, yeah, that's called deposition. I had to look at the word, it's called deposition. And now the opposite can also happen. Sometimes it uh, snows you, or you've got ice on the ground and it disappears over days, and yet it never melted. Uh, and that's uh, sublimation is the name for that. So yes, it, they're, those processes aren't as well known as melting ice or boiling water, uh, which are things that we see often. But yeah, uh, it is possible, gas to solid and solid back to gas without going through the liquid state. Katie, I'm embarrassed to admit all the times in my life I've seen frost or you know snow disappearing. It never occurred to me what was actually happening there, happening there with skipping that the middle phase of, of the liquid. So thank you for enlightening me on sure. that. Um, so let's talk about the human body. How much of the human body is composed of water? Yeah, actually, we're mostly water. Oops, I just kicked my camera. Um, <laughs> yeah, we are mostly water. Uh, it's estimated about 66% of our body is made out of water because every cell has water, our, certainly our blood. Uh, so that's why we have to keep drinking water. In fact, they say that uh, if you're in a survivor, survival mode, you can live three minutes without air. You can live about three days without water. Uh, or Let me get this right. Three, um, three hours without heat. If you're in a really, really cold, cold, cold environment, uh, you need to get heat. Uh, and then the next priority is clean water. You can actually go a long time without eating. So if you ever get uh, in a situation where you're lost, remember, think in terms of staying warm and getting clean water before you start thinking about eating food. Because yeah, we're mostly water. 
Thank you. And that's, that's good advice. Although it is challenging for me not to think about food. <laughs> yes. <laughs> good point. Um, so I had a question about the international uh, coastal cleanup. You were talking about it's a specific time of the year or a specific season or day. Is that, and if there's people that want to participate that more holistically in a group, in a community, um, how can they find out uh, within their region who they can hook up with to participate? Yeah, great, great question. Yes, so the International Coastal Cleanup is organized globally by the Ocean Conservancy. And if you go to, you know, just Google International Coastal Cleanup Ocean Conservancy, some combination of that, and you'll find their website and they have a map and you can find out what's going on in your area. Actually, Pennsylvania has a huge turnout, huge turnout of volunteers, as does uh, New York, New Jersey. In Virginia, we have usually between 6,000 and 8,000 volunteers every year. Um, and even if you live in an area that does not have an organized international coastal cleanup event, you can organize one. You and your family, you and your uh, friends at school or at work, can organize cleanup. Some cleanup events are organized by businesses, churches. Um, so if you don't see that somebody else has taken a leadership role, then you can take a leadership role. And this year, the international coastal cleanups, I think are going to look different because of COVID-19 and social distancing requirements. Uh, I think instead of big events, like every year on Chicoteague, National Wildlife Refuge, we usually have a cleanup that involves two to 300 volunteers. But this year, instead of bringing 200 people together at one time, we're encouraging people when you're out in a park, pick up litter. It doesn't have to be on a certain day. Uh, and the International Coastal Cleanup used to be one day, uh, the third Saturday of September every year. But the window is actually September, October. So it's, uh, it's great for flexibility. Any day that you're out there, you can collect uh, information, uh, collect the litter, collect information. I also wanted to say, I went to an international conference uh, two years ago, and there were people from all over the world who were talking about this issue, keeping plastic out of our waterways. And one inspirational man said, this can no longer be a special event of picking up litter. It has to be a daily thing. It has to be a daily commitment because just like there's people, unfortunately, who litter every day, there need to be people every day picking it up. And it's, it's humbling. I mean, it's very humbling to go out and pick up somebody else's debris, but nothing makes you feel better. At the end of a cleanup, whether you did it for 15 minutes or two hours, you can see the difference you made and you know that everything you picked up, you've kept out ultimately of the river, the stream, the ocean. So um, if you want an inspirational, fun family event, go pick up some trash and also consider collecting data because then you can help long-term. Short-term picking up litter is always helpful, but collecting data gives your efforts a, a long-term value that's just really, really important. Thank you, Katie. Thank you so much. That was very well said. And um, I'm thinking back to your slide where it had the top uh, pollutants, and I think it was like the top 10, eight of the top 10 were, were food items from people. And so what I'm thinking about in concern to that is that that means that we as individuals, the individual choices we make, our individual behaviors can have a huge impact on water conservation. And I'm wondering, Katie, what strategies or what techniques do you find the most impactful for your education and your outreach um, to inspire people to want to change their personal behaviors um, to, to prevent litter? Yeah, great question. Um, when we started doing research about balloons, okay, so uh, we brought together people who said, yes, I organize balloon releases. You know, I do them for birthday parties or uh, other events. And we asked them, you know, what, what, what are you thinking when you release the balloons? What would be an acceptable alternative? And during that time of bringing these people together and listening to them, 
we heard over and over a lot of people say, I never thought about it. I never thought about where the balloons go after they go up in the sky. We go back to our party. And for a lot of people, just that awareness made them commit to changing their behavior. I remember one young man that we spoke to, he said, yeah, I, I've gone to parties where there's balloon releases. And he said, there was a funeral I went to and there was a balloon release. And he never once thought about where the balloons went. And then when we told him 100% return to earth, he's like, I got it. I will never do this again. He said, I'm done. I, I will never release a balloon again. And I think he, like many other people, once they become aware, they're like, I got it. Um, some people are more motivated, not by uh, perhaps preventing litter as they are by the pocketbook. Um, like if you add up how much it costs to use bottled water every day for a year, it is a lot of money that's just being wasted absolutely wasted because studies show water uh, bottled water is often just tap water that's been bottled <laughs> so uh getting used to carrying a bottle of water from your home uh takes a little bit of getting used to like I, when i first decided to use reusable shock, shopping bags i always forgot them in the car and so i'd have to go back out but after a while you get used to it so you know, people are motivated by different things, I guess is the answer. Some people are motivated by sea turtles. I am, I love, I love all turtles. And the thought of any debris that I create getting into the ocean and killing a sea turtle, I mean, I'm motivated by that. Other people are more motivated by money. We also learned that about 20% of electric power outages are caused by balloons that hit power lines. And we found that some people are super motivated by that. I mean, one woman, I remember telling us that she wasn't as concerned about balloons in the ocean, but she was very concerned about losing her air conditioning. <laughs> so people are motivated by different things. And as an educator, that's one of the things that I have had to learn is just because I will change my behavior because I think one way, you have to really listen to the people who you want to reach and see what motivates them to change their behaviors. Thank you uh, for sharing that. Um, that was very hopeful uh, to hear <laughs> that make people change. So thank you so much. We have one final question as we're coming to a close of the program. So Katie, who actually regulates the water that we drink? Oh, okay. So if you live in a municipality, uh, the water you drink is provided to you through a service you pay for, obviously, and it's regulated by the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, the EPA sets standards, like your, you know, the water has to meet certain standards, and local municipalities test the water uh, constantly <laughs> to make sure that they meet the standards. Now, people like me, I live on a farm, I have a well, I'm in charge of my own water quality. And so once a year, I grab a water sample and I take it to a laboratory and I have them test it. Now, I'm luckier than most. I can test some of the water parameters in my own laboratory uh, at Longwood University because we do some water testing there. But for the most part, people who live with uh, well water, the, you are in charge of your own water security and your own water quality. Um, but most Americans, in urban areas uh, can be uh, very assured that their water is being tested regularly. Thank you so much. And Katie, just much gratitude to you for sharing your time and expertise with us today. It was a fantastic presentation. Thank you. Thank you. It's, I've enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Yay. And it's <laughs> nice to see you again. And to our wonderful audience who joined us today, thank you so much. It means a lot to Hawk Mountain that you're able to connect with us at least virtually during these times. So thank you so much. Um, and remember our trails are open at Hawk Mountain and um, we are selling uh, trail passes online through Ticket Leap and we have some modifications for social distancing. So check that out on our Facebook or on our website. And as always, we have many more virtual programs coming your way soon. And this is what we have in store over the next week. This Friday, July 3rd, we have 
Migration and Habitat Selection of Golden Eagles in North America with Lori Maynard at 4 o'clock p.m. Next Wednesday, July 8th, we have Pennsylvania Mammals with Dan Lynch of the Pennsylvania Game Commission at 1 o'clock p.m. Next Thursday, July 9th, we have Sanctuary Storytime, A Color of His Own at 11 o'clock a.m. And next Friday, July 10th, we have Support Your Local Pollinator with Barbara Ritzheimer, one of our fantastic volunteers, and that's at 4 o'clock p.m. So have a wonderful rest of your day, and we hope to see you again soon. Take care. Bye.